Welcome to the Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Dr. Greg Nikandri. Dr. Nikandri currently serves as the Chief Medical Information Officer of the University of Rochester Medical Center. That's an eight hospital, $4 billion health system. As the first system CMIO, Dr. Nikandri established and grew a clinical informatics team that drives provider and system technology and workflow adoption, resulting in meaningful improvements in patient and provider experience and high value care. He's also a practicing orthopedic surgeon, which enables him to experience and understand on a deeper level the changes his team makes and its impact on his colleagues, family, and community. Dr. Nkandri received his medical degree from Virginia Commonwealth University, completed an orthopedic surgery residency with the University of Washington, and went on to complete his fellowship in sports medicine and shoulder surgery with Duke University. Dr. Nkandri, Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Alan and Joshua. It's really a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. It's so awesome to have you on the show. Um, you know, you've shared in the past, I think it was a previous conversation, yeah, as far back as you can remember, you always wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. And so I was really curious to start the conversation, like where did that drive come from? So it's it's a little bit of a long story. I'll try to give you the, the abridged version, but like most orthopedic surgeons, it starts out with an injury. And so uh, I grew up local uh, in Rochester, one of the suburbs called Webster, and uh, I went sledding with my family down uh, Suicide Hill. And uh, instead of uh, hitting the jump on Suicide Hill, I ran into a tree at the bottom of Suicide Hill and uh, fractured my femur uh, and ended up um, at uh, Strong Memorial Hospital, which is where I work uh, right now um, on the children's ward. And this was at, at age five. And back then, um, we didn't really do surgery for that. So I was actually in the hospital for three full weeks in traction. Wow. And uh, my orthopedic surgeon, uh, Dr. Uh, McAllister Everts, would come by and round with his team every day. And, and one day he came by with my x-ray and showed it to me and said, hey, Greg, do you see, do you see where your fracture is? And I said, oh, yeah, I think, I think it's right there. And of course, you know, it was a, a compound fracture, uh, severely shortened, angulated, um, you know, biggest bone in the body, super easy to see. But of course, you know, being the great doctor that Dr. Everts was, he was like, wow, that's really good, Greg. You know, you should be an orthopedic surgeon when you grow up. And so really like from right there, that kind of stuck in the back of my head wow. um, that, that that's what I wanted to do. And then, you know, um, my parents recently moved and they, they, you know, came over and dumped a bunch of stuff from the, the basement into my basement. And one of those things was uh, an eighth grade uh, meeting with my guidance counselor that said, uh, Greg wants to be an orthopedic sports medicine surgeon. We recommend that he takes Latin and yada, yada, yada. And so, um, I guess, you know, I'm just really lucky that, that everything kind of worked out. It was always something I was interested in. I always pursued other things to kind of try them, but it always came back to uh, orthopedic surgery and, and sports medicine in particular. Wow. That's a very aptly named uh, hill that you, that you went sledding on. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. So, um, you know, also, from what I could tell, you, you've you always been a strong advocate for shifting kind of the, the traditional surgical training paradigm, the see one, do one, teach one to more of a, a prepare, practice and perfect. And I think it was way back in 2013, maybe even earlier, um, you were already explaining the benefits of virtual reality and, and using simulation technology to, um, you know, really train properly and, and prepare surgeons for their, their training in conjunction with, uh, I think it was the asset tool, the arthroscopic surgery, surgical skill evaluation tool. Um, so with that, I have a three part question, like one that was a long time ago, that was like 10 years ago, at least. Um, so first I was curious, how did you find out about virtual reality technology for surgical training? Uh, and then two, why do you believe in this tech and uh, and in addition to these evaluation tools for our future surgeons. And then the last question they have is, is how has this technology evolved since the time when you were first introduced to it, uh, you know, over a decade ago? 
Yeah, so I think, you know, it even started out, um, the interest was peaked in my residency because um, I think, you know, the lay public and myself at, at that point didn't really understand how surgeons are trained and credentialed in America. And um, it, it, it just struck me that there was kind of a wide variety of surgical skill amongst surgeons who were doing similar procedures. And that, you know, when we trained residents, we assessed their knowledge by giving them a test or having them sit for a board exam. And that all of a sudden said, okay, you're good. You can practice surgery on patients uh, or you can do surgery on patients, but there was never really any assessment of their technical ability or skill. And me as somebody who was trying to learn fundamental skills, um, I never knew kind of where I was on that on that curve. Was I was I good? Did everybody have the same experience as me? Because you actually go through residency almost in isolation. You, you do it with yourself, with a, a preceptor in the operating room, but you don't know really how you compare or where you are in your learning curve in comparison to others. And so um, I got very interested in that and really started thinking about, okay, um, how can we assess surgical technical skill better and that led to the arthroscopic surgery skill evaluation tool because i felt like once you have a more objective assessment and at that time years and years ago i did a thorough literature search just assuming that there would be one and there really wasn't and so we kind of went about developing our own and then once we had a tool to actually assess skill then we could go back and say okay how can we evaluate different curriculums against each other or beyond curriculums? How can we evaluate different simulation methodologies against each other to determine which one is the most effective and efficient and yields the most transfer to actual real operating room skill? And that interest kind of followed me into fellowship uh, where another you know, great mentor of mine, uh, Bill Garrett, directed me to say, hey, you know, you're really interested in curriculum and uh, evaluation of surgical technical skill and the Arthroscopy Association of North America is working with uh, some simulation companies on uh, developing a new, a new simulator. And so that really got me connected with that group uh, and just kind of started and, and progressed from there. Uh, and I think a lot has really changed over time. So there, when we started, it was really, we've got cool technology and we're looking for a problem to solve with mm -hmm. that cool technology. And as orthopedic surgeons, we were just kind of jumping into the technology world. And so we kind of said, all right, well, let's use this cool technology to simulate every aspect of a knee arthroscopy so that you can do the entire thing virtually. And you know, what we learned was that the simulator simulated some aspects of arthroscopic surgery really well. Um, but you still couldn't, you know, even as good as the haptics were on some of those things, you couldn't completely mimic the normal look and feel and uh, some of the unexpected things that happen during surgery to really make it uh, a true fully simulated experience. Um, but then, you know, thinking just evolved over time and you started to figure out, all right, well, you know, I maybe don't need a super high fidelity virtual reality simulator to train some of these things. Maybe some things are trained better with just the curriculum and the reading material. Mm -hmm. Some can be trained with the low fidelity. Um, like I think now a lot of the haptic stuff you know, you really want to use the real instruments that you're using and practice putting in implants the way you normally would. Um, but then to really understand procedural steps and make sure that you know what normal looks like and what abnormal looks like and what the common pearls and pitfalls are, you know, uh, virtual reality simulation is is great for that. And, and it's become a lot more ubiquitously available and generalizable. And so I'm, you know, I'm excited for the future of that for sure. And Greg, just to kind of summarize that a little bit, that, that was an amazing um, introduction to it. Thank you for that. So, so it sounds like for things that you're saying, maybe in terms of getting the procedural steps right, there's a role that can be played 
with this technology. Um, is part of it too that for certain procedures that are less common where it's hard to get volume in, does this play an important role or is that not so much the case? I think it depends on what kind of simulation that that you're talking about, right? So that's a problem that you're trying to solve. And now you have to figure out, okay, of the technologies available to us now, what's the best way to solve that problem? So do you invest, you know, $100,000 in a very complicated simulator so that a surgeon can perform that procedure twice every five years? Probably not. Um, what I find is that you know, a lot of uh, with practicing surgeons, um, you kind of have the basic fundamental skills like, you know, how hard do you press with a knife to make the surgical incision? How do you, you know, in orthopedics, insert a screw uh, into the bone? How do you drill? How do you insert guide wires to hit your target? As you do that stuff over and over again, those things translate to lots of other procedures. And those are the main haptic skills. So once you're actually in practice, I think the most important thing is actually learning the steps of the procedure and how the implant gets put together and what normal anatomy looks like, what abnormal anatomy looks like, and what recreated anatomy looks like after you're done with the surgical procedure. And I think that's where, you know, virtual reality simulation with a headset uh, can be very effective if it's tied to a curriculum um, that has the different steps and proficiency benchmarks built in. Like you need to hit all the steps in order within a certain time frame to be proficient so that you're almost not even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've kind of released that cognitive load of all of the steps. And I think that benefits you as a practicing surgeon when you get into the operating room with the patient so you can focus on the other nuances of the procedure as opposed to that other stuff that um, before, you know, you would have to read a technique guide and maybe you'd read it once before mm -hmm. you went in and did the procedure or you'd watch a video on ViewMedi. But doing something in the VR world where you can do it 100 times over and over and over again and complete all the steps in two and a half minutes, to be able to do that, you've got to really know what you're doing. Uh, and, I, and I think there's a lot of benefit to that. Gotcha. I love how something you, you referenced, I think a few times here is it's not so important to just implement technology for the sake of implementing it. It's important to understand like, what is the problem to be solved? And then does a certain technology actually solve it? So you seem, you seem like a very practical person in terms of your approach to, to technology. Um, you know, in 2019, you became the CMIO for, for University of Rochester. Um, was there a problem you were trying to solve when you took on that role or what was the backstory to that? So uh, that it kind of happened <laughs> by a happenstance, I think. You know, um, we were searching for a chief medical information officer. And at that time, the problem for my colleagues, I think, was frustration with uh, electronic health record and burnout. You know, we had implemented Epic years before and we didn't really have a chief medical information officer for a while. And so we hadn't optimized Epic to meet real time clinical workflows. And so it wasn't working for our clinical faculty and they were, they were frustrated. And I had gotten involved as a physician builder for the department of orthopedics. I had started making some changes within our departmental, uh, E record, and I think that was largely seen as being pretty successful. And, and I enjoyed seeing my colleagues be happier and more efficient and be able to get home, dinner families, and, and things like that. And, and started to realize, okay, I can have a really broad impact on my colleagues and my patients and my community um, that I, I grew up in. And, and so that impact is what caused that job opening to become more appealing to me. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring. It's another level of leadership. It's something that I really wasn't considering. So if you asked me, you know, six years ago, was I going to be a CMIO? I would have said no. But I was kind of like, you know, this is this is a good opportunity and something that I might enjoy. And I was like, you know what, if, if I'm not good at it and I stink, I can always fall back on 
you know, uh, a pretty, pretty great job in being an orthopedic sports medicine surgeon. And uh, over time, as I stepped into the role and, and started uh, taking on more and more of the challenges, I've just found that I've enjoyed it more and more and more. Um, and and uh, it's that it's that impact that kind of keeps me coming back. Um, and I think the problem, honestly, is still the same. Uh, you know, COVID maybe kind of changed things a little bit, but the provider burnout problem that we have, you know, may have been predominantly caused by electronic health record previously. Now it's caused by lots of other things, but it's it's exemplified. You know, now that we have the staffing shortages and, and you know, a lot of the stuff that's going on right now, uh, I, I would say burnout's at an all-time high and we need to get even better at doing what we were trying to do before. Can I ask you, like, um, you've been doing this for, I guess, formally for, you know, over three, almost four years now. How has the the role of the CMIO kind of evolved from your perspective? So I'll give you an example. Like I've heard some CMIOs say to us, well, you know, you, you know, over the past decade, it was really focused on either implementing or optimizing the EHR and, and improving, you know, life for, for the clinicians. And, and now with digital health transformation um, involving patients more and more lately, especially since COVID, the CMI role for some people has evolved to be more, you know, patient engagement or remote monitoring or, or just touching the patient more than it did before. Um, how do you think about that evolution over the last couple of years? So I think about it very similarly. I, I think, you know, CMIO 1.0 was, uh, you know, implement the EHR and, and um, you know, help, help get everything moving in that direction. Then, the EHR is implemented, you have a bunch of disgruntled physicians. So CMIO 2.0 was optimize and enhance the EHR to make workflows better. Um, and then COVID happened and um, really accelerated the digital health transformation. And the CMIO got involved a lot more in strategy. And so I think a lot of my role uh, started to be uh, helping with our, our chief digital officer and forming strategic partnerships um, with technology innovators uh, to try to really move our uh, vision forward. And also there's a big role in data and analytics mm -hmm. because our ability to generate insights that actually improve care right at the bedside is greater than it has ever been. There's so much potential there. Uh, I think the problem is, is that we've got way, way, way too much data and we're probably not asking the right questions. Going back to what I was talking about before, what are the problems you want to solve and how do you ensure that you have good data going in and insights going out at the right time to the right person through the right channel? And I think um, that's something that, that, you know, can only be solved through a partnership with technology and informatics, making sure that the workflows uh, are, you know, supported with technology that's configured appropriately. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Greg, you mentioned, you know, CMIO 2.0 is the the era of let's optimize our EHR and you know get all the processes to ensure that the workflows are all simplified. And I know you've mentioned in the past how you're a proponent of that sometimes means optimization through deleting processes. Um, and it sounds almost like an addition by subtraction. And I think that's such a an interesting paradox that really does ring true. So I'm curious, could you explain like what's one example of a process that you've actually just completely eliminated from the workflow um, and what was the impact of doing that kind of uh, uh, an optimization through elimination? Yeah, so it's, it's challenging to take stuff away uh, from people even when they don't like it, right? So, uh, you know, probably our biggest initiative aimed at deletion was just around uh, clinical decision support and BPAs. Hmm. So, you know, two years ago, we had sepsis BPAs firing every five minutes as soon as you opened up the chart and we were ignoring, you know, 98% hmm. of, of them. And so they just weren't effective 
uh, BPAs. And so we, you know, formed a team, a uh, clinical decision support team, and basically started looking at all of our BPAs. And we established different criteria for what's a good BPA and, and what's not a good BPA, um, and then started eliminating them. And so over time, you know, we actually just our informatics team got t shirts this year because we had like over 2.4 million clicks eliminated oh, wow. this year or something we had these like mcdonald's themed um t-shirts that that we handed out this year so that that was a really good initiative um we uh did a you know dc the cc uh getting rid of the cc'd uh result notification mm -hmm. so you know we were automatically cc'ing pretty much all result notes to our physical or to our primary care physicians oh, wow. uh, so this is you know, any chart for any provider that we, or patient that was seen by any provider got CC'd. Any lab that was ordered by anybody got CC'd. And, and their in-baskets were just absolutely getting deluged. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing about that was when we, when we said, hey, we're going to turn all these things off from you, there was a very vocal 5 to 10%. They were mm -hmm. like, no, 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 I need that. And, and I think those are the people that are kind of like, you know, they're, for lack of a better word, they're like the hoarders. Like you mm. feel like you always need that. Mm -hmm. But if that is buried in 7,000 other results, are you ever actually really going to see it? Is that mm -hmm. the most effective way to get it? And so we, we kind of went back to our best practice recommendation, which is actually saying, if you're the ordering provider, you're responsible for following up on that result. And mm -hmm. that comes to your in-basket. If there's an abnormal result that you think the PCP needs to be made aware of, then you actively click a button and CC that mm -hmm. to that person. And so instead of that being a needle in a haystack for the PCP, they actually get it and they see it and and can do something about it. Hmm. That reminds me of one of the, the terms that I learned this year, I forget from who, but it was the concept of the, the anti-pilot where what you're piloting is an elimination. And the idea would be that if we take this thing away, let's see what happens if it ends up you know impacting you know uh, patient care in a negative way or it leads to more frustration we can always bring it back but if we take this workflow or, or, or thing away and it doesn't lead to anyone complaining or it doesn't cause a problem then i guess we didn't need it and so even things like do we need this recurring meeting every month well let's get rid of it for a month or two or three and see what happens and like oh wait everyone's still collaborating really well huh i guess we didn't need it after all and maybe you needed that for six months or a year before because things were, were rocking you're figuring things out things out but then you hit a maintenance moment where you didn't need it but you just kept it on on the calendar um so it makes me wonder like, what are all these things that we could anti-pilot in the health system and then bring it back if we have to and it's okay i think it's really hard in healthcare for some reason for folks to recognize the difference between one way and two-way doors mm -hmm. uh you know we always feel like if we turn something on, it can never be turned off again. Mm -hmm. When in reality, you know, you can always go back if it's mm -hmm. a if it's a bad idea. In in very few cases is it a you know we're heading in this direction. And it's forever mm -hmm. you know faded to be that way. And I think it's important, you know, when you're when you're deleting stuff to recognize, yeah, we can always turn that back on if it if it doesn't you know doesn't work or leads to some dissatisfaction that we don't know about. Um, because we get caught up in the what ifs, like instead of solving the 10,000 what ifs, how about we actually just turn it off and see what happens for mm -hmm. a little bit. And then we can always just turn it back on. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you, you've been, um, you know, really invested in is this, um, heart program. Um, it's, it's University of Rochester's health equity and anti-racism technology program that focused on eliminating variation and providing same quote unquote same care um to enable you know more equitable outcomes for patients using tech um can you tell us a little bit more about that it sounds pretty exciting yeah so we uh started this up now uh probably um two years ago uh, just recognizing that you know we have all these care protocols and you're trying to apply them to every patient who comes in and so everybody is getting same care but that fails to recognize that humans are all individuals and some individuals need stuff that is slightly different or differing levels of assistance to achieve the same 
health outcome. And, and so kind of shifting that mindset through the utilization of different technologies and tools um, was how we sought out to, to do that. And so we, um, we had an issue where our demographics uh, collection methodology was, was kind of flawed. So, you know, the first thing was we wanted to um, collect data on our patients to understand them more. We wanted to make that data visible. So we said, uh, collect, visualize, connect was our strategy. Yeah. So we wanted to collect data. We wanted to make that data visible within the workflow to the physicians who were taking care of that patient because, you know, as a provider, we know Rochester is one of the most impoverished cities uh, in the country. We have the highest child poverty rate in the entire country, and everybody knows that. But you, as the provider who is taking care of a child, do you know whether that actually impacts that kid that's sitting in front of you in your office? And can you figure that out in the 15 minutes that you have to be able to talk and evaluate them? And so making that information available to the physician at the point of care so that they can consider those factors along with the treatment plan that they're going to be offering them, I think is very important. And then, you know, the connect piece was basically um, trying to tie in resources uh, for patients when they have identified needs um, to be able to make those available within the electronic health record. And so we, um, you know, partnered with our local 211 uh, to get that resource directory available in the EHR. We stood up uh, programs um, for housing, food, and transportation within the hospital uh, because we recognized those as our biggest needs. And so once those needs were identified, we were able to get people hooked up with those care management programs. And we're also teaming with our community-based organizations who are fantastic on trying to figure out ways of, of doing closed-loop referrals kind of on down the line. So I think we've, you know, kind of had an issue where our dem data was not good so we had to revamp our intake forms we had to get folks to buy in to to how we were going to ask those questions why we were asking those questions why they wanted to answer them why we needed them to update them um, and that flowed into also asking the social determinants of health questions mm -hmm. i would say the biggest barrier we had though was that physicians kind of pushed back a little bit initially when we said hey we're going to start asking social determinants we're going to ask about food insecurity transportation insecurities and said the physician said you know i i can't give the patient a pill for that mm. and i've got 15 minutes to have a conversation with them and i don't want to spend 10 minutes talking about something that i can't solve and that they can't solve and we're just there mm. kind of wringing our hands um, and so that's where the two-on-one um, thing came in um, because it allowed us to say, all right, we've got a resource that we're putting in. We know it's not ideal to just give somebody a handout and say, hey, call this number, but it's at least something. And oh, by the way, our messaging to you as a provider is not that this is your problem to solve. This is our health system's problem. This is our community's problem. And we are doing other things to try to solve this for our patients and our patient population. What we're asking of you as a clinician is to take the information that we're giving you so that you know that patient on a deeper level, consider the treatment plan that you're offering them, and try to figure out whether any of the social determinants may impact that treatment plan and, and may uh, make you think of, of offering something slightly different. Mm -hmm. So I think we were able to get good buy-in that way. And then once we started having patients identified with needs, that drove which programs we were gonna set up uh, and and things have kind of uh, snowballed uh, from there in a in a very successful way. And, and Greg, I'm curious. At this point, um, have you reached a um, a situation or a program where you know, let, let's say you're collecting these new data points on social determinants of health, and you're able to maybe flag things that are, are risk factors for a, a disparity or a bad outcome? Um, are we yet at the point where, based on what's flagged? Um, decision reports actually automatically recommending, recommending different um, approaches to the treatment protocol or the cure pathway, or is it mostly still, hey, we're flagging this for something you'd be aware of and, you know, use this in your assessment to potentially change the pathway or the protocol, or, or are we actually automating some of these clinical um, decision support uh, pieces based on the terms of health? So we're not at the point uh, in our organization really where we're automating. I think that's where we all hope to, to get to. Um, but I think all of these things need to 
stay in a uh, kind of a you know a stepwise process um it's just like the evolution of ai uh everybody wants it to be this fully autonomous <laughs> thing but you know really there needs to be engagement and partnership and i think obviously that's best for um for for healthcare i think we we do have some things outside of the social determinants where we are you know we we um uh, built a decision support tool uh, pre-operatively for patients in orthopedic surgery uh, around our bundles for our, our total joints. Mm. And we realized, you know, one of the biggest um, factors uh, leading to, to higher cost was obviously going to a skilled nursing facility mm. post-surgically. And um, we asked all of our patients uh, promise questionnaires pre-surgically on pain interference, physical function, and, and mood, um, as well as uh, getting some information about social support at, at home. And we have uh, a little um, tool that goes right into the electronic health record that is a sniff predictor tool. Mm -hmm. So when you're considering signing that patient up for surgery, you can say, hey, you know, you, know, you don't want to have to go to a skilled nursing facility after most patients want to be at home mm -hmm. if they possibly can be and we say you know if you do you know these three or four things you can actually dial in different factors on that tool to say hey mm -hmm. if i do this like if i set up a um, visiting nurse or i set up a family caregiver coming what are the chances that they're going to need to go to sniff and you can see that kind of go down on the dial so that's a, a tool that clinicians kind of grew to trust because they could interact with it. They knew which data was going into that tool. They could manipulate it a little bit mm -hmm. to see different outcomes. And it facilitated a conversation with the patient so that you could deliver the care and kind of hospital course and outcome that they expected. Because now they said, okay, I'm not really expecting to go home or mm, I'm expecting that I'm going to need to go to a skilled nursing facility and, right. and we should have these things set up beforehand. Yeah, that's great. I had a question, Greg. Um, you know, it sounds like a, a lot of, you know, whether it's uh, a new workflow that you're implementing or a new technology or, you know, just a specific change, a lot of it comes down to change management uh, amongst the staff and clinicians. Do you have any like best practices or or just, you know, one or two principles that, you know, you know, if you get this right, then change management is at least easier? Yeah, so I love this. This is where everybody falls down. So I, this is like, um, I think the biggest area for uh, improvement and, and change management is a fundamental skill for every organization. And I, I don't think that we necessarily do this well in, in hospitals. So I love the ADCAR uh, method uh, of change management. The key thing that you need to do initially is to listen. And so you've got to go out and you have to listen and try to figure out what is the pain that people are experiencing. And um, as you then go to build awareness for what you're trying to do, you, you know, the, the key is shifting awareness of what your intervention is to get people to actually desire. You, mm -hmm. you need to build that desire. And what builds the desire is identifying for your audience the what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a different thing for physicians than administrators, mm -hmm. uh, than operators. So a perfect example of this is like our, our secure chat rollout. So the initial messaging around our secure chat, when it came off my, I came across my desk as a, as a draft was we're rolling out this new secure HIPAA compliant messaging platform for providers, all of your patient and provider info will be safe. And I'm like, that's, you know, that's not really what the providers are telling me they need. What the providers hate is that they get random pages in the middle of the night to call back 14534. And they work at nine hospitals. They have no idea what extension 14534 is. They have no idea what patient it's about. Um, they don't know who the person is that's actually paging them. 
and now it's woken them up at two in the morning. And so they have to walk and, and go answer that. And so, you know, what we were really using secure chat for was to fix that. You know, you can actually dial in the level of interruptivity. So if this is just the lab saying that, or, or the pharmacy saying that, hey, you know, we dispensed 120 pills instead of 122 like you prescribed, mm -hmm. they can send that as an FYI that now doesn't wake you up in the middle of the night because it's not associated with a, a breakthrough notification mm -hmm. alert. When you get it, you know who sent it to you, what patient it was about every single time, and you can respond mobily on your mobile device. So now you don't have to go to a computer or worse, go to a phone, right. wait for somebody to pick up on the other end, wait for that person to find the person who actually called you, which might be five to 10 minutes, and actually complete the process. Right. So that is what physicians want and what they've been asking for. And so with change management, you need to understand that Physicians need to understand that that is what you're delivering to them with this particular tool. Um, if you're advertising to the security team and you're giving the same talk about secure mm -hmm. chat, you're telling them, hey, you want secure chat because it's going to protect the, the, the data and be more HIPAA compliant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, with all of our initiatives, it's very important to understand that you've got to dial in your what's in it for me and your messaging. I think we, we fall down on A, we don't get to awareness soon enough. We don't build the desire. Mm -hmm. And so we usually just start right at the, you know, here's the tool that we're going to give you and here's the training. And then we also don't go back and reinforce the change after. And so the way that we do that is we make sure that we have KPIs with our initiative. We're tracking how we're doing, and if we're starting to fall off, like like with our social determinants of health, you know, we started taking that on every patient, every inpatient admission, and we had 70% compliance the first couple of weeks, and then it started to go down to mm. 50, and then we could kind of track and say, hey, why is this going down to 50? What's the what's the deal here? Um, and you can stay on top of it, and understand that the project doesn't end at go live. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a, an incredibly important point. It, it's kind of like when you think about um, yourself in the physician's shoes, and let's say as a physician, I wanted secure chat. And to your point, if I went to security or IT and said, hey, I want secure chat, it's going to help me streamline this whole paging issue. It's really frustrating for patients and all that. But when you're a security person, when you don't live that day to day, it's hard for you to truly empathize. But if a clinician went to security and said, hey, and by the way, it protects the data, it's safer, it measures up, you know, a breach or anything like that. Then they'll go, oh, okay, so now I too want to solve this problem mm -hmm. because this does affect my day to day. And, and it's, it's obvious in hindsight, but to your point, when you're living in the weeds, you're kind of like very rationally self-interested. You're thinking about how is it gonna help me? But we need someone like you, Greg, in the organization to be like, hey, we actually have to facilitate all these different perspectives and, and bring it together. Um, it, it seems it's obvious, but it's very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that, that, that is that was really good. That's a hundred percent my job in mm -hmm. uh, a nutshell. I I basically help ISD with the messaging, and I help our mm -hmm. providers with the messaging uh, to make sure that we're aligning incentives. Because really, at the end of the day, everybody is on the same team and heading in the same mm -hmm. direction. Um, there's just a lot of like inertia that I think prevents us from from getting there more just because of the way we talk and present things. And when we think about like where digital health is going next, where, you know, in the past technology was very focused on the clinicians and the administrators and people in the organization. But now that we're getting more into digital health and it's almost like there's this third stakeholder outside the four walls, the patient who needs to be engaged digitally going forward, that adds another layer of complexity where it's okay, I gotta, I got to answer what's in it for me for all three parties to mm -hmm. use a digital health platform. How are you thinking through that one lately? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we're engaging a lot more with our um, uh, communications and our patient experience team. I mean, we just hired a, a, a provider who uh, is focusing totally on uh, patient experience for our, our organization, uh, pulling the right people together to make sure. I mean, there's a whole different like you know you've got to be educating within the the right uh language uh the right culture uh the right education level uh i mean it is a whole uh whole nother nut to crack mm -hmm. um 
beyond just educating nurses and physicians. Totally. Yeah. If we, if we thought two, two types of stakeholders were, were complicated, you had a third one in there. It sounds like yeah. a, <laughs> it's a nice web there. Uh, yeah. I mean, we have to get there, but it's, uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah. So Greg, actually maybe a good segue. I wanted to ask you, you know, there's now this, especially post COVID, just this explosion of patient facing innovations. You know, you have your chat bots, you have your digital care journeys, remote patient monitoring. I'm curious, like, what are you the most excited about regarding patient facing innovations? So I love chatbots. Mm. Absolutely love chatbots. Um, we initiated one as part of our uh, digital front door, um, you know, initial phase of the, the digital transformation um, to help with patients uh, finding a provider. So to help our find a provider tool. Um, but, you know, what I learned from that is that just by having that out there and, and even, you know, we didn't really have it dialed in great. We didn't have great algorithms associated with it. But the most important thing we got out of that was that we understood how patients were searching for us and what they were searching for. And so you could understand what terms they were using, what types of things. I mean, we found out that the most common reason people actually came to the website to look for things was actually related to, to dental. And we didn't even have mm. anything dental on our website. We have a great dental school and openings mm. and, and all of that stuff. Um, and so um, it was just extremely informative. And so now, you know, thinking about leveraging that in other ways to, again, like, if you want to know what your patients need, ask them. And mm. this is one way for them to tell you without you having to actually, you know, pick up the phone and ask. You're collecting it more passively. So I think as a source of uh, information for mm -hmm. us, it's been outstanding. And obviously, um, it, it's very easy to use and something that the patients really um, like. Something I'm not as high on is just the, the remote patient monitoring. Um, I think that, you know, again, we have tons of data. And frankly, uh, you don't need new data to tell you about the same problems that you always knew you had. You make sure that you're asking the right questions and that you're actually trying to use the technology to solve a fundamental problem for your organization. And um, with the remote patient monitoring, I just haven't seen a lot of good evidence about broad uses where that significantly drives improved patient outcomes or, um, you know, changes management um, terribly significantly. And mm -hmm. so I think we're kind of focusing on, on other areas um, right now. I mean, the, the biggest things that I'm excited about is, is for me, Another thing I would love to delete, I'd love to delete the, the computer and the mouse from the ambulatory mm. clinic. Mm. I mean, it, it is sucking mm -hmm. the life out of medicine. You know, the, the doctors, they're typing and clicking and pointing into the electronic health record basically to enter data for the learning health system. Well, you've got a patient with a scowl on their face staring at the back of the doctor's head. Doctor's miserable, patient's miserable. Uh, and so using, you know, ambient technology to just have a conversation and have that collect the data. And oh, by the way, doctors and nurses suck at entering structured data. Computers and, and, and devices are great at doing that. And right. so um, not only do you give providers time to do what they do best, which is, you know, educate and communicate with empathy and compassion, you also allow the technology to do what it does best, which is enter the structured data to give us the insights that we want in the future to give better care for that patient. So I think, you know, that's something I'm excited about. Um, optical intelligence, extremely mm -hmm. excited uh, about the that, you know, related to any kind of flow uh, issues. You know, our nurses, I think there's potential for great opportunity there. The nurses are spending 50% of their time you know, typing things into flow sheets, 30% mm. um, of time looking for stuff and 20% of time in patient care. Well, that 80% where they're typing into flow sheets and looking for stuff can be handled a lot with, with the optical intelligence. Mm. Um, you know, we've got checklists for checklists 
uh, right now. And checklists improve quality significantly. But you know, if you're trying to do an A-line these days as a nurse, you've got the A-line checklist. But before you can get to the A-line checklist, you've got to do the prep the skin site checklist. And it's just you know, click after click after mm -hmm. click. Um, leveraging some of these technologies to, to help that happen with, you know, virtual nursing or, or that sort of thing, I think has a lot of promise for us. You, you know, what strikes cool. me uh, as very interesting from, from that, that point, Greg, is in, in lots of other industries, um, typically like we'll see adoption of new technologies for like outside healthcare um, and solve some kind of either similar or analogous use cases and then eventually migrate its way into healthcare. But what's funny is that when I think about ambient technology, like take like let's take our, our company for a second. You know, we have meetings, we take notes, and for some reason, I, I have yet to see lots of companies adopt ambient technology for let's call it documentation of meetings or other things internally. And I'm wondering why that hasn't happened yet. And I'm I'm thinking maybe it's almost a bigger pain point in, in medicine and healthcare. Like I I I I can't remember that many times in our company where people are complaining like, oh my gosh, I have to take all these notes, but I, it feels like a much bigger pain point in healthcare. Do, do you think that's why we haven't seen Ambien in, in other industries, but it's really now a thing in healthcare or is there a different reason why um, we haven't maybe yet adopted that outside healthcare even? Yeah, I think, I, I, I kind of think along your lines where, you know, you've got one person taking notes for a meeting of 40 or 50 people and they distribute the notes Everybody, everybody's got a nice set of notes and that just seems to work out well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, automating that job um, for, you know, that purpose and having the technology not quite be totally perfect mm -hmm. yet, um, it's probably, you know, more trouble than it's worth right now. But for the use case in medicine where it's, you know, every single visit, you know, we spend, we know in our, in our, um, group for um, 15 minute visit, you spend seven minutes in documentation. Yeah. And that's seven minutes that you're either doing after clinic uh, on nights and weekends, or you're limiting your patient visit to eight minutes. Mm -hmm. So you can have seven minutes for documentation. And um, that time is extremely valuable any way you look at it. And so I think that's that's why it's become a, a, a bigger issue in healthcare. Yeah. That and just the, the, you know, we know the documentation burden is one of the key drivers of burnout. Yeah. Um, and, and that's such a big issue. Makes totally sense. makes sense. Yeah. Um, so Greg, just being mindful of your time, let's flip over to what we call the fast five lightning round. This is basically five questions to get to know you better for our audience. Uh, first question we have is what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? So I'll go with, yeah, the, the book I've gifted the most and, and uh, favorite book is Leading with Heart uh, mm -hmm. by Coach K. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm a Duke Wee. Uh, <laughs> did my fellowship at, at yeah. Duke. And, um, you know, I grew up being a huge basketball fan. I was in, you know, middle school and early high school during the, the Duke kind of glory years mm -hmm. and always, you know, went to bed at night envisioning that I was going to play Duke basketball. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I never made it there until I went through orthopedic surgery, residency, and then got a fellowship. And as part of the sports fellowship at Duke, you are the assistant team physician oh, for all of Duke athletics. So I got to sit on the sideline. Mm -hmm. uh, literally like 13th on the bench, right next to the guys oh, with wow. the towels that run onto oh. the, to the court and wipe up all the sweat. And um, before I started, Coach K gave us signed copies of that book. Oh, wow. And I read it and it was awesome just watching kind of how, um, how deliberate he actually was. You, you would see things that he was doing with the team that you would think were just happening randomly, mm. but they weren't. Wow. Uh, because by reading the book, you kind of knew that, that, okay, he has to build a team every four years, right. and there's a process, That's and cool. there's like key things that have to happen to promote growth in his team, uh, and relationships that he has to build with each member of the team and the greater group of people that supports the team. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just very interesting, you know, taking that book and that experience together. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think 
it's just very well written uh, mm. and translates extremely well to um, you know healthcare teams. I think mm. as well. So yeah. I tend to have my team read that. Did, did you um did you watch the Redeem Team documentary? I watched part of it, but I did not see the whole thing. Oh, huh. it, it's I mean, the whole thing is pretty good, and a lot of great Coach K stories mm. about him transforming like the culture of that that Olympic team. Um, yeah, he's a phenomenal leader. I love that suggestion. Oh, that's great. Uh, question two, Greg, uh, who is a person dead or alive you'd love to meet? That is a good question. And one that I have not thought about in <laughs> quite a long time. I don't know. Um, I mean, we're happy skipping it if you want to. Yeah, I don't, uh, you're content as is. You've you've met all the people you'd like to no. meet. Where you met Coach K. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is a. Would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? Oh, holy cow! That's that's always. <clears throat> this one's definitely uh, something that I have not gotten into a conversation about <laughs> since college, at least. <laughs> um, and I think my I've probably changed. Um, I think the ability to read people's minds would just drive me absolutely insane mm. and couldn't do that. I think I'd go with super speed, mm. uh, especially if it's like the kind of speed like Superman has to kind of spin the earth backwards oh, yeah. and go back, back in time, time. Yeah. Like flash or just, you know, <laughs> getting, getting stuff done, um, you could do so many cases in the air, you know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the orthopedic surgeon in me right great. there, for sure. Oh, that's great. Um, all right, question four. And, and I just have to say, Greg, I love how these are the questions that are stumping you, but the the real technical questions that are, you know, to do with all these advancements digitally, you have no problem knocking those out of the park. That's really funny to me. Uh, question four, though, th what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? So I, I think it goes back to that, you know, original thing that 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 um, that we were talking about, um, you know, that you can actually train and learn surgery without being evaluated on how you actually technically perform mm -hmm. surgery. And what I'm saying is that patients like will go to a surgeon for a rotator cuff repair and they think that that rotator cuff repair, no matter what surgeon they go to, is going to be performed with mm. the exact same level of quality and expertise. Um, where, you know, the literature shows, you know, for other similar operations, that up to 27% of your clinical outcome is predicated on the technical skill wow. of the surgeon performing the operation. Wow. And so I think it's, it's definitely a quality issue for the boards and hospitals to be looking at. Uh, you know, if you want to provide high quality care and good outcomes, you need to kind of have some measure of that. Yeah, yeah no, I love that. Um, last question that we have, Greg, this is more of a pandemic lockdown related question. Uh, what is one hobby or activity you've gotten into since the beginning of the pandemic? Yeah, so my COVID uh, hobby was that I picked up the guitar. Oh, nice. Um, it's something I always wanted to do. And so I grabbed an acoustic guitar and I went online and found this uh, Justin guitar okay. uh, guy and uh, really liked his method because you could start playing songs really from day one. He taught you three uh, chords initially, you practice the chords, and then you could play the song and they were all arranged for like your level. So the right. first one sounded absolutely awful, <laughs> um, but you could kind of tell you were playing the song. Cool. And, um, you know, over a year or so, I got to be able to play uh, some songs and, and uh, you know, it's really relaxing just to go into the back room and, and mm. um, you know, really uh, kind of, uh, you know, strum away. Yeah, no, that's awesome. It's such a such a different like skill set while still, you know, using your brain in a, 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 you know, a way that expresses creativity and gets you moving all the moving parts. Um, Greg, did you want us to come back to that <laughs> earlier question the person you would love to meet? Yeah, no, I just don't have anything like super, good. but if you ask everybody,
all the five questions and we just skip that one on me, then I'll feel, uh, <laughs> I'll feel less than, <laughs> but that's all right. I know you guys got to go and that, and that won't yeah. be a good answer from me. No, it's fine. That's totally fine. Um, I like to ponder it. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, well, Greg, I, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. Um, that's a wrap for this episode of the Digital Patient, hosted by Seamless MD. You can follow us on Twitter at Seamless MD, and if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, uh, you can visit www.seamless.md. Uh, Greg, honestly, thanks so much for sharing the pearls of wisdom in this conversation. I know our audience is going to take a lot away from it. And I, I certainly did as well. So thanks so much for sharing your time. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys having me on. It was a great conversation. Uh, really fun. Mm -hmm.